As is the case for all mammals, newborn mice receive their initial nutrition from their mother's milk, which is first broken down into low molecular weight components in the digestive tract, and these are subsequently absorbed into the bloodstream. At about two hours after birth, a black striation appears in the middle portion of the cartilaginous precursor of the metatarsal bone. This signals the initiation of bone formation. By 12 hours after birth, bone begins to develop along the long axis, as indicated by the dark area seen in the center of this field. After 24 hours, the area of calcification has expanded. Bone forming cells increase in number and blood vessels carry vital nutrients and oxygen which activates the developing bone tissue. Within 48 hours, the blood vessel enters into the bone and in the interior of the bone, the marrow is now evident. The bone grows constantly being formed and resorbed throughout the lifetime of the animal. Owing to the mechanical strength provided by the developing skeletal system, the baby mice are soon able to actively move about their environment. In addition to the needed nutrients, the blood also transports various hormones required for proper bone metabolism. Within 10 days after birth, the blood vessel network surrounding the surface of the developing bone has increased significantly. Vitamin D3, parathyroid hormone, and calcitonin are known to act both on the bone-forming cells, or osteoblasts, and on the bone-resorbing ones, known as osteoclasts. Using the technique of tissue culture, we can actually observe the behavior of the two kinds of cells as they continue to perform their functions outside of the body. At the right side of the field, we can see a portion of calcified parietal bone taken from a mouse embryo. Around it, osteoblasts and osteoclasts are actively working to form new bone. This and the remaining tissue culture, cinemicrography, were taken at one frame every four minutes. Calcification in vitro begins at the edge of the explanted bone and appears as a brown area extending from the original explant. Bone resorption also occurs simultaneously in the areas indicated by the dotted lines. This is bone formation as it occurs in vivo. What interactions and communication between cells are necessary to induce bone formation and resorption? First, we would like to observe bone formation at higher magnification. The osteoblasts are oval in shape and pile up, thus making a colony. Ten hours after the beginning of cultivation, the young cells divide and increase in number. This is the first cinematographic record of living osteoblasts in action. The field in view is only about one hundredth of one square millimeter in area.
as the culture time lengthens, a refractive matrix gradually develops between the cells and becomes thick and dense. This matrix, composed of collagen and sulfated mucopolysaccharides, is produced and secreted by the neighboring osteoblasts. The osteoblasts soon become surrounded by this matrix and their motility gradually diminishes. It is now 60 hours since the culture was started. Once an osteoblast is completely entombed within its matrix, the cell is then referred to as an osteocyte. After 80 hours in culture, the cells have developed a bone matrix. Now, hydroxyapatite crystals precipitate within the matrix, thus initiating calcification. Next, we would like to show how osteoclasts destroy bone. What is the progenitor of the osteoclast? These osteoclasts are relentlessly destroying bone. These multinucleated cells resorb the bone very efficiently, appearing to dissolve it before our very eyes. How do osteoclasts communicate with osteoblasts? The osteoblasts in this field are actively producing new bone, while in a nearby area not seen in this field, osteoclasts are actively resorbing bone.
What communication do osteoblasts have with other cells? At the edge of the matrix, the osteoblasts are piling up. Bone tissue has the ability to produce new bone even after resorption has occurred. In this field, osteoclasts are actively removing aged calcified bone. Now we see two active osteoclasts separated from one another by a bony partition. Having voracious appetites, they begin to devour the bone between them. Like workers building a tunnel, they rapidly approach one another from opposite directions. The cells themselves die after having resorbed the bone. Because of the presence of both osteoblasts and osteoclasts, bone is a dynamic tissue, capable of being remodeled under appropriate physiological conditions. However, if bone loses the proper balance between formation and destruction, it will become abnormal. And this balance is controlled by complicated intercellular communication and by various hormones related to bone metabolism. If there is a deficiency in vitamin D3 and other hormones, normal bone will not be produced. Homeostatic regulation of the concentration of calcium in the blood and other body fluids will not be maintained. Bone metabolism can be said to be life itself. 